Hi, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games, and it was an absolute blast for me to talk to Corey Barlog, creative director on God of War. If you're a designer, a creative director, an aspiring creative director, or, or anybody involved in development, you need to listen to this. Corey goes deep into what it took to make God of War, the victories, the struggles, the philosophical discussions he and the team had about key features in the game, and he describes what it took to get over the hump and explains the reasoning behind many of the decisions that led to what is one of the most groundbreaking games we've seen over the last few years. So please join me for a great chat with Corey Barlog. Welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Corey, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good to be here. And uh, I'm, I just want to talk a little bit about Twitter. Twitter. And given that you've just released arguably one of the biggest games in the last several years. Oh, thank you, sir. That's sweet. How, how has the response been for you on social media? It has been pretty amazing. Uh, I have been very negligent in Twitter. Uh, when I got back to Santa Monica, I think I had like 800 or 900 followers or something like that, and I wasn't really that active. It actually befuddled me. Twitter was confusing to me. I was like, I don't understand what you're supposed to do here. Uh, and it took you know, years of, of neglecting it still that it was like, occasionally I'd do an interview or something and, and, and interact with Twitter a little bit. But it wasn't until I finished and then went on the sort of press tour where all I did was sit on planes and go to hotels and go to do interviews where I realized, like, oh, cool, Shu does this, basically. He's traveling all the time, so you're just on your phone, right? So I basically engaged and found this fantastic connection to the community. It was so cool. Like, the, that before the game came out, people were still talking about it, talking about interviews and stuff like that. But, man, when the game came out and to kind of get the responses, and you get this weird mix of bug reports, which I always find fascinating. They're just like... People don't know game development when they're going to the game director and being like, here, let me tell you this exact bug, and, and can you fix this for me? Like, <laughs> you don't know anything about game development if you think the game director has any <laughs> say to do that. So, But I pass it on and uh, make sure that somebody gets their eyes on it. But just hearing these great stories. I mean, game development in my lifetime of game development has never had that situation where somebody says, I played your game. This made me understand why my dad and I had an estranged relationship. Or, I mean, I've gotten some incredible, incredible letters. Letters that are so emotionally open that are talking about the fact that their their father died and they never made up with them, right? Like they never sort of bridged the gap and they were so resentful and so hateful and they had these, these sort of feelings and that when they played the game, it was like this catharsis for them. Mm. It was them seeing a side of who their father might have been. Now, whether or not their father was that way, they were able to at least kind of cross some sort of barrier that they had. It's amazing. Like, I don't know. I guess something very strange happened with the release of this game. Like, that felt like not only were people comfortable talking about some of these sort of emotional scars or sort of big events within their life, but people are positive, too, which is awesome. Right, because we do have a problem, I think, in general on the internet of people just being perpetually negative, right, and just wanting to just crap on other things so much. And I don't know. I mean, for me, I just I like the idea. Like for me, my Twitter feed is all about being positive, connecting with people, and actually, you know, enjoying the fact that I'm part of a gaming community. Right, that there's so many other things aside from what I've done that I'm so enamored with that I'm happy to be not even just considered a peer, but just be part of this community, be a player as well as a, as a maker. I think it's amazing. Well, I think being a, the fact that you reply to people and acknowledge their questions and answer their questions is unique, especially when you're talking about someone who's high profile as you in this industry or any entertainment industry. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I, it's... I, 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 I look at it as I would have loved if there was Twitter 
in the eighties and I could have written to Steven Spielberg and talked to him about Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? And and I feel like I'm not Steven Spielberg and that's not Raiders of the Lost Ark, but at the same time, how cool is that? Right, that maybe inspires somebody who, in the future, is gonna create a Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's cool, man. Well, well, I, you're right in that this is a tool. Social media in general is a tool for us as developers that no other creative industry has really embraced. I think as much as games, yeah. given that yeah. we we ask for it, we yeah. ask for feedback all the time, and for us, it's really important to know what players like and don't like because we are putting a lot of ourselves out there. And we want to make sure that we are fulfilling those dreams, yeah. not just for ourselves, but for others, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we don't make this stuff for ourselves. Yeah, like, and I think that's a cool that's a cool aspect of this industry that we are self aware enough of that that we know the line, right? We know the line to say like, I am not a huge advocate of the concept of concept testing, but user testing is brilliant, right? Yeah. The idea of like, did you have fun? If you didn't have fun, why didn't you have fun? Why were you confused at this? Did you not know where to go? You know, the the sort of visceral reaction versus, do you like red or blue, right? Like that's useless in my opinion. Like it doesn't mean that I don't trust other people's opinions. It's just that when you do that, all you do is just sort of get that subjective opinion and you're not really following the vision that you want but the objective of like is what we're doing enjoyable yeah right and i think anybody who forgets that you end up making a game that you're surprised why doesn't anybody like this it's like because i don't think maybe you let anybody in you didn't let them in to say hmm this wasn't fun and this why it wasn't this is why it wasn't fun even if it's a deeply held belief like i must do it this way there are times when you're just wrong right and i'm wrong all the time i think that's the i hope i never lose that that acknowledgement that I'm just every day wrong constantly. Well, I, it's great to admit that. And I, I believe that that's something that's difficult for most developers to admit often, especially as if we are new to the industry or we're new to yeah. design, programming, art, and getting our first piece of critical feedback <sighs> and embracing it is, I, I don't know about hard. you, but it's, it's... I wasn't good at it at the beginning. Like, yeah. I think all of us, yeah, we're, it's it's hard. It's a... I think that comes with the age and the wisdom, right? And also taste failure, right? If you taste failure, if you it's that freaking salty, bloody taste in your mouth that you're like, oh man, I don't want that again. Yeah. Right? Like I made a lot of bad games. And those bad games were not made by people who were bad. They weren't made by people who were like, screw this, I don't care about it, right? They tried very hard, but lots of odds were stacked against them. But to remember the moment that you were eviscerated by the public and the reviews and realize like, I don't want to feel that again. Right? No question. I, yeah. th I think it, in some ways it's good that when we have those experiences, if we can survive them yep. as a company, a team or an individual, it does give us that perspective. That's very difficult to get yep. any other way. You got to lose a lot of fights, I think to be good. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing. And I think a lot of people look at it as, as losses, a bad thing, but I think, man, getting knocked down, uh, getting, getting sort of uh, knocked out is, is good because then you go, all right, if I can learn from this, if I can look at it critically, if I can be smart about this, I know I can make sure that I don't repeat it, not because I think I'm the greatest, but because I know how to not be there and get hit in that point, right? And then be open, right? And I think that's, I was very lucky when I started at Santa Monica because Jaffe really had a good understanding of that, right? He pushed so hard in what was it 2003 that playtesting had to be part of a you know weekly or bi-weekly sort of involvement like we had to play test like twice a month which was not a usual thing right now everybody's got full playtesting rooms with observation areas and stuff but at the time we just had to like kludge one of our own together between two conference rooms right uh and it was his pushing of saying this is how it's going to get better like put somebody in a room with a gray box right but test out the theory of a puzzle the the sirens in god of war one the sound puzzle which was basically like move left move right the sound will get louder mm -hmm. so the siren sound is basically in a sandstorm all that was in a play test was a gray room with red lines on the floor and then a sound like a, uh, and it was really annoying sound by the way uh and the more you stayed on the red line the louder the sound would get so what he was testing was where people get the connection between those two things. Now, the line was there to just provide a visual reference because we didn't have anything else there, but then eventually the line gets pulled out and then they start to follow the sound and say, can you get this, right? And if they do, then you enter into the six months of development of trying to get that puzzle to work. And I think that right there is fantastic, 
right? Like that, that, that opened my eyes to make me realize like, oh, wow, it has nothing to do with ego or knowing anything, right? It's not like, oh, I'm so confident this is going to work, right? Which is weird because heading up a project, you still have to think like that. Right. You still have to portray the, I know exactly what's going on, right? Uh, so that people believe and follow, right? But you also have to be the person to say, no, I'm wrong. Moving on, right? And were, you, were there times right. on God of War where you had to say, "Up, oh, I'm wrong? Oh, yeah, all the time. Uh, sometimes I would say it to people directly. Uh, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm somebody that when, when somebody has a really good idea, I pivot as quickly as possible and say, like, no, that's really good. That best idea wins. There are other things, the no-cut camera, right, which is one of those things where it's a, it is a, a vision, I think, as opposed to a, a sort of subjective or objective problem to solve. So it is more of a, no, I know this will work. And I can't explain it and I can't point to anything to, to tell you this is why, right? It is one of those things where you just have to feel it over the course of the game, right? And that's, that is the hardest thing because you're basically saying, let me finish the whole thing and then you can tell me whether or not it works. And by the way, you're going to have to work a whole lot to try to get this and solve problems that nobody thought they would have to solve. So, yeah, it's a weird, such a weird job, right? Being like, well, you uh, it, it sounds the way you're describing it, it's the balance of vision, confidence, and then a, being able to admit when something doesn't work and, yeah. and cut, yep, kill. You know, yeah, th those are that's sometimes that's the toughest thing to do during development, okay, right? Yeah, cutting things sucks, right? It's I, it is so much easier the way you're talking about it. It is actually much easier when you're like, mm, that doesn't work, we should get rid of it. That's actually really good, and I love doing that. It's the scoping ones. It's the ones where they say, we don't have time, we don't have budget, we don't have people. We have to get rid of this that I usually end up turtling up and turning into that guy from the first season of Project Greenlight. Where he's, oh, absolutely not, over my dead body. Or the guy who directed uh, Boondock Saints. You ever see that documentary? I did, Overnight? Yeah. <gasps> Such a good documentary. So this documentary tracks the the sort of beginnings of the, the, the guy, and he wrote the script, Boondock Saints, it... Covered well all over town. Everybody wanted it. Harvey Weinstein ended up flying out, buying this guy's bar, letting his band do the soundtrack, and then letting him direct the movie. They wanted the movie that bad. And then it was just this sort of like unraveling of a human uh, as they they sort of like went way too big, way too fast, and just literally burned every bridge that they ever could before they even finished the movie, right? So it is, it is the greatest cautionary tale to any creative on the planet. Right? That's really good advice. Then yeah. everybody listening should yeah. go watch that. You should watch Overnight. You should watch two movies. You should watch American Movie and Overnight. You find out what passion, true passion is when you watch American Movie. You hmm. see a guy who lives in, you know, a small, uh, I think it's Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? And literally is financing his independent film with like credit cards that he's getting through the mail. Like, yes, $500, <laughs> right? Like, it is like, and, and just will tirelessly pitch this thing with so much passion, right? I, I, can't really say to the quality of the end product, right? Because that doesn't, in my mind, really matter. That's passion, right? That's the Rudy level of passion that that guy has. You need that, and then you need the cautionary tale of overnight to see, like, don't, don't do this, right? Know exactly where you came from, and know that, like, some of the best people, right, never forget that, ever, ever forget that. So for the seamless camera, was that passion that got it through? Hmm. Because it sounds like, the way you describe it, you probably had to convince people almost every day that this was going to work, even though maybe it didn't come online until fairly late. Yeah. Is yeah. That, I mean, even when it came worked? online, it's a, col it's a collection of the whole experience that really sells you that, oh, it's going to work. Playing 10 minutes and saying, seeing it, you're just like, nah, it feels like a gimmick. It was a fight the whole time. Like, and that, that, that is not even hyperbolic, that it, there was lots of arguments about it. Because and I and I understand it. Like I don't begrudge any of the team for for pushing back on it because it's their life, right? They have to do the work, right? There's there's extra work involved to get all this stuff done, and and each piece, it really just sets up for the next group's work, right? So we were doing work in the last four or five months to make sure that every character was positioned properly to line up for the beginning of a cinematic and then positioned properly to exit out. If you were like, I'm a jerk player who's going to back into this area, right? And look over to the right. How does the camera, how do the characters handle Yeah, how did you do that? We, we talk a lot about that here at Insomnia because we've, when we see something really great in another game, we, we tend to mentally deconstruct it yes. and ask. We do the same thing. So, so in those edge cases, how did you manage it? 
So they, they have so many different systems in place in order to handle the characters. I think had we not built Atreus, we would never have probably done this. Why is that? Because Atreus is sort of pathfinding and his ability to compensate for the, the odd behavior uh, and his ability to hit his mark took four years to get right and 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 had we just tried to do it with you know the camera we probably would not have put the development in for the other characters to be able to position themselves correctly and actually hit a mark i was always mystified at why it was so hard i was like why is it so hard it's a freaking computer right the computer <laughs> should know to hit that mark right there and then they'd start explaining it and math and i would eyes would glaze over and, and i was like okay whatever make it happen um but it is a it is an interesting sort of collaboration between so many different departments. So mm -hmm. the gameplay department of figuring out how the individual characters will handle it. The camera group to figure out how the camera will then sway back to its rest position. And then it's it's the offset. So it's the sort of implementation group to say, okay, I don't want all this stuff to happen at once. So as you're approaching something, we start scooting you, right? We start nudging uh, with a blend mm. to kind of get the character in place. And then the other characters start to move where they're going to go. Then the camera starts taking over just a little bit, right? And then nudging where it's going to go. And then eventually, they both almost reach 100%. So that everything is kind of coming in on these sliders almost okay. at various uh, degrees. And it's, it is a human touch, right? It is a feel. So that you do it for one, and that same set of values, that same set of blending would be different on another one. Because you're like, oh, well, this person can come in here this way. We have collaboration with level, level design as well to say... In these situations, we can't fix the edge case. So you can't always fix it. So right. sometimes somebody can back in, face the other direction, and it'll just look terrible. So in those cases, we put in some sort of interaction, a door, a lift gate, or some kind of thing, hop over, in order to ensure that when you do those, we actually close everything in, bring the camera, hmm. hop the character over, then every character kind of lines up, or a drop down where Kratos would grab Atreus and then kind of set him in place. Those are our ways to reset and kind of funnel and bring the player where they need to be. So, so it, every transition was tweaked in some way, so manually yeah, tweaked. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's the that's the um, sort of ugly secret of all Santa Monica games is that everything is just hand done, right? Like it's it's a lot of people go, oh, what is the what are your tricks? And it's like there's no tricks. It's just like lots of sweat equity, lots yeah. of people just going in and saying, I've tweaked this and manually set all these different things. And then gone to the next moment and done the same thing, but with a different sort of set of values. So it's, it's well, exhausting. the craft shows. I mean, I think that attention to detail sometimes takes that that manual touch and that yeah. massaging because computers aren't all that yet. No, where they can they can think for us and anticipate every single problem. That's where. We have to be. What a scary clever. future that is, though. If like it's AI coming, right? start making like games, like <laughs> I guess it'll be a lot more time for us to play games because it'll be like whatever, man. Hell nine thousand took care of this one. So <laughs> we don't have to do anything. Well, you mentioned you mentioned Atreus, and I know for a lot of us at Insomniac, for a lot of fans out there, he provides such a another angle on the franchise. Early on, when you were discussing what God of War would be, how important was Atreus? Uh, pretty much the linchpin. Um, really? Yeah. Like when I, when I, I started talking about it to Shannon before I got back, but in the first four weeks uh, of being back, I created a PowerPoint presentation that I ended up redoing um, in like the last, you know, probably like a December or January. Like I, I, I at one of our Friday gatherings of the, the entire studio, I basically presented that that presentation as if it was four weeks since I got back and as if the audience was Shuhei and Scott. Uh, kind of to point out to the team that as a high-level goal, four weeks into it, we hit almost all of our high-level goals of saying, you know, the, the reason that Atreus is there is because the audience needs a fresh start and Kratos needs a fresh start, right? We're not starting over, but we need that sense of, you know... Uh, the comparison I keep making is is the idea of the reinvention of yourself when you go to college, right? Mm -hmm. That you're not, it's not like you stop being you, it's that you're like, nobody knows me. So I have this opportunity to to sort of reset a little bit. Uh, nobody ever fully resets and, 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 and loses everything. They kind of start slowly fading back into who they were. And I think that, to me, was the motivation. I think some people initially were like, I don't understand, it's so weird, why does he have a kid? And it's just like, look, this was... This is one, the opportunity that the, the Atreus is the audience. 
the audience who has not gone with us on this journey. So anybody who hasn't played God of War gets to experience this through Atreus's eyes and sort of see this world and sort of start to understand and learn this character. But he's also the driver, right? Like, yeah. And some of it's taken from my life in the sense that when I had my son, it made me go, how much of me am I really going to show to him, right? Because clearly we have our own demons, right? And that own sort of negative side of ourselves uh, that I think foolishly like like Kratos that you can kind of prevent your child from ever seeing, right? Like I, I am horribly plagued with OCD, like big time. Like it is a struggle I've had my entire life. Uh, and, and I thought, whatever, that's something I don't have to, I can try to control this, right? Which is stupid that you think you can control it. Uh, and, and he won't see it. But the reality is this is genetic. This is something I gave to him, right? Mm -hmm. So he has the same, he has it worse than I do, right? To the point where like, we can't, like, there are certain orders that we have to do things in. Like, I can't go in the car until he's opened the door, right? And then I'm able to open the door and then sit down. If I don't, freak out for like 45 minutes right freak and, out for you or freak out for him right freak out for you no uh, for him yeah okay. and for me i'm just that like uh everything has to be sort of ordered and placed right like if there's a bunch of stuff on a table like i have to make sure that it's all squared and righted right but that translates all the way out to if i tell somebody you know i want to do this this and this right those three things are very important that I've called out specifically. I've say like, I, I want something in the idea of this, a lot of freedom to go in. But when I get specific, if it's even slightly off, I like obsess about it and I keep going back to it, right? To the point of annoyance, right? To the point of nuisance to people. Do you, do you tell your team that? Do you explain, hey, this is how I am. I, when I say these things, this is really what I mean. I try. It doesn't always go that way. I think one of the lead level designer, Rob Davis, had told me about halfway through the project when I just flipped out at him. I was like, what is going on? I've told you this, like that I want it this way. And he's just like, I just have this rule that if a creative director tells me something three times, then I understand that he's serious. <laughs> and I was like, you need to forget that rule. I'm like, if I tell you something once, that means I want that thing. But if I'm vague and I'm like, look, I don't know, figure something out here. Or like, I just want to feel this emotion while we're here. Let's explore that. That's the freedom point. But yeah. when I say... I want him to turn right. I want it to look like this. I want you to look exactly over to there. There were a few moments that I like reached total and complete frustration. Uh, the moment when you meet Brock and fucking gratitude, um, and Atreus says to throw the axe into the thicket of trees, right? Now, to me, that moment was very clear. It was like, look, there's a monster hiding in the trees. The fucking gratitude can sense it, this is how we show that Atreus can actually hear him. And he says, throw the axe over there. You throw your axe over there and the trees shake like King Kong or Jurassic Park, where you just see trees shake and there must be a monster there. Dude, that went on for years trying to get that moment to work. And I was like, I don't know how else to explain it. And I'm like, I don't know if everybody's just like, I hate this moment, so I'm going to keep doing it. I don't even know if they were trolling me. To this day, maybe they are trolling me. And they're just all laughing, you know, and saying like, we're just being deliberately obtuse to try to mess with you. Uh but I, that one just felt like, man, I knew exactly what I wanted. I felt like I was explaining it correctly. I felt like I explained it to so many different people, but it was just never really connected. Uh, I think that's when you have a very specific thing you want, that's the most frustrating part. Yeah. Right? And I think with Atreus, the lucky part of that was I was able to keep speaking in concepts of fatherhood. Mm -hmm. And they are universal because maybe you don't have kids. You still were a kid at some point. Right, and I think that connection that people can have uh, and feel like, oh no, I get that. And, right, like our moments in the previous games began with like, hey, we we can make him uh, cut somebody's head open, or like you know, uh, ride this creature. That'd be so cool, right? And like every moment in this game began with, hey, it's the first time you have a beer with your dad, or first time you see a fireworks show with your parents, or first time you go on a roller coaster, right? Like every one of those moments began with these kind of milestones of childhood, these sort of senses of wonder. Because when the moment is over, it means more when it began from something that is a universal human experience versus check it out, this is so cool, right? And I think that's a testament of the studio, the creative people, right? And even a little bit of myself growing up, right? And, and realizing there's more to what we do, right? Than just the surface level or the ability to do it, yeah. right? Like, I think something that I love about development is that when we get together as developers, we go, how did you do that, right? That's awesome. Like, that, 
how did you do it is amazing because that is how we begin we get better right that's what gdc used to be right which was just like let me show you this cool trick right right and we used to share these tricks with each other um but then there's the sort of like away from other developers when you're just there and you're like you know it'd be great we could just do this thing and that's cool but sometimes you just sort of get lost in that you get lost in that spiral of just trying to well we did we could we try to top ourselves we're just trying like the like the games God of War 2 to 3 to uh, Ascension. I mean, I can't speak to the ones that I did not work on, but I feel like that was a pervasive concept anyway of just like, we've just got to top ourselves. It's got to be bigger than before. Yeah. Right? I, it seems to me that, I mean, especially how, with how you describe the Atreus discussions that you're, you were giving more meaning to the features and the gameplay hooks in the game. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, to me as a player, that was absolutely apparent with, Things like Atreus being able to read when his dad can't read. Yeah. And it's just those, I mean, that's a, obviously a lock and key mechanism that you have in the game, but it does have so much more emotional impact than any other lock and key mechanism I've encountered right. in design. It's And so when you talk about, I can, I can totally see how that approach really elevated the the craft of the game and, and brought story and design together in a way yeah. that I don't think many people have seen. Uh, so Kratos though, as a character, w I, was that a more difficult transition to make than say introducing somebody like Atreus? Mm. It was because so many people at the studio had worked on Kratos or had come to the studio to work on Kratos. So really? They, yeah. They so came. they specifically came and said, I want to, I want to play this guy who's lopping off the heads of Hydras. And... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a, there, there's people that are just like, look, I came here to make these sort of gory, crazy animations. And I was like, that's awesome. But right. I spent a, I spent a good portion of the first two, maybe two and a half years trying to take out all the things that are like that. Not because I expect them to never be in the game, but I feel like those are the foregone conclusions, right? Mm -hmm. To do a violent, you know, sort of head chop off animation is like, cool, we already know we can do that. And why I can say this, because we've done it like seven times. Let's not focus on that. Can we make something that is more subdued, right? So the axe wasn't a throwing axe for a while, right? I wanted to just focus them in on the idea of getting the axe to feel different from other weapons, combat to feel different. And the theory was if the axe stuck, right? So that I was showing them these like Russian fight videos, right? Where these people just go in like, you know, random places in like, like in a parking garage in Russia. And it's just a bunch of people punching each other, right? Just random fight clubs. But pointing out that when you look at like a fighting game that we've done, we do a single animation that follows through, right? And then we do a hit pause in the middle of that. And then this animation is identical, right? You just play that whether you succeed or you fail, the animation is unchanged. We just pause the state of the world or even just the two characters involved. Um, but I said, if you watch this, the animation completely changes. When they actually connect with somebody, the whole body changes, the stumble afterwards change, the follow through changes, like everything feels different and it feels weighty and heavy. Uh, I was like, can we do that? Can we look at the axe and just keep it in his hand and swing, right? And a lot of people were like, oh, so grounded, it's too much. I was like, just mm -hmm. let's let's explore this. Let's find something, right? Uh, and in the end, we did, uh, I think, 20% of what we experimented with. So, like, it was really heavily paused. We did full animations that were synced up together. Uh, I think it was really cool, but it definitely didn't play very well. Uh, but it taught us something. It taught us that like you could make something feel very different. A lot of people say the axe feels very weighty and heavy. Yeah. And that's because we went really way too far with it. And then we pulled it back. And then I sort of said, release the hounds, right? Everybody can go crazy now. Make a magical axe, do all this stuff, right? But in the beginning, if all we did was go full magical axe, we might have not ended up with, I think, that sort of marriage between the the sort of grounded and the fantastic, right? And I think it was the same with the character of Kratos that everybody thought, why aren't we going to have any sex mini games? He needs to be ripping off everybody's heads all the time, right? And this isn't Kratos. And the third one, this isn't Kratos, is the voices that I listen to the most, right? Yeah. Those were the ones where we, we really said, all right, well, we wrote the opening sequence, the, you know, don't be sorry, be better uh, sequence of the hunting. We rewrote that for many, many years, hmm. right? That was over and over and over rewritten. That was our test case to try to find a point where everybody on the team would say, okay, I buy it, right? Beginning, it was too mean. Uh, then it went too nice. Hmm. And then it didn't sound like him. Um, 
you know, created or people hated to trace. He was too whiny. Like it was just trying to find that perfect mixture until we actually kind of found the one time playing it for everybody uh, that was basically we found at E3 2016 because we had no choice. It was like the forcing function. It was the same with the no cut cameras that the the technical director came to me and said, you know, don't talk about the no cut camera at E3 because what if we can't achieve it? You don't want to end up like uh, Peter Mano. And I was like, dude. I don't really care. I'm going to talk about it. I'm like, if for nothing else than to force the fact that we're going to do it, I need you to get on board here. I'm not, this isn't like, "Mm, maybe we'll scope this out. This is the thing we're going to do for this, right? So I need you to get on board. He's like, yeah, but we might not be able to do it. It just might not scale. And it was coming from a place that to complete E3 2016 took way longer for that nine minutes than it should have. We would never be able to complete the game. So they were all right, just based on math alone, that they're like, this doesn't scale. To do this would take 15 or 20 years, right? I think that's a truism, though, in game development. Yes. When, when you are presenting something publicly, especially when you're in the middle of production, you're going to put a lot more polish and time into it than, than is reasonable. Yep. And even then, at the state, like you said, at the state you're in in development, yep. what you would do to take a polish level to that extreme is like 40 times harder than it is a year or two later, right? right. Because you haven't finished anything. We literally had a primitive lighting system. So we had that whole controversy of like downgrade, God of War downgraded us, right? Uh, It was because that was actually the downgraded lighting system that they were experiencing there, which was like it was lacking some of the atmospheric effects. It was lacking some of the the sort of niceties, the snow, all of that stuff was just sort of faked out with what we were able to do there, because literally every aspect of the game was being built from scratch yeah. all at the same time. So it's like, I don't, I don't know, I literally will never, ever, ever, ever do that again. I will ask better questions in the beginning to figure out the state of things. Well, that's a, that's a great statement because we debate pre-production and how to, how to run it smoothly mm-hmm. frequently, given that that is the time when things can either be sort of the utopian ideal where yeah. everything went perfectly and we move into production smoothly or more likely things go in a million different directions and eventually you get to production and you're not ready. So yes. what is your, what do you think the more realistic approach to pre-production is now that you've gone through this massive game and you guys have done things that nobody could believe you've done. Uh, if you look ahead, what do you, what do you think the right approach is? Mm. I mean, we had the weird challenge of we ended pre-production a year early. So we expected a year of pre-production beyond. And we ended it early and, and got 150 people. So that part sucked. Was that, I don't, so why? What happened? The dark side got canceled. Oh. So it got canceled in the middle. So we were relying on their release to be the give us some, some runway. Okay. Right? Uh, and it just, that didn't work out. And then we just had to scramble and react. And I mean, that's... That's what you got to do. That's the, the the sort of truism of all development. Yeah. But I think for me, pre-production... I mean, here's, pre-production a, here's is, a question for you more yeah. specifically. What comes first, story or design? Mm. For me, story and design are a very similar thing. There's the concept, the high concept, but then I like to work out an outline. Mm-hmm. Right? I work for more of the gameplay outline, which is kind of like this story, location, characters, beats that kind of gives everybody the, the the starting point to work from. Um, but then they start to branch, and, and each one of them goes off on their own tangents and then continues to check in to ensure as things change. The continues to check in part is the one that we're not so great at, so yeah. a lot of the times that's where the friction comes from. But I think, I don't know, for me, pre-production is always messy. It's like you can't fight a nice war, Yeah. right? It's it's idealistic and would be great, but the reality is like it is messy. But that's the great part about pre-production is it should be messy it is kids with crayons drawing on the freaking wall right it's chaos and it should be it should be experimentation it should be failure it should be aha moments that are ugly right that only developers can look at and go "Ooh, that's really cool a lot of the 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 neatest things come from accidents right the 360 um spinning uh grapple hook from god of war 2 was a mistake right? It was a mistake. Somebody implemented the grapple hook point uh, inverted, right? And then because of that, when you attach to it at the velocity you attach to it, you just start spinning around, right? And uh, I think Eric Williams brought me over and showed me that. and was like, oh, look at this. So broken. And then he goes, but... 
And I was like, where are you going with this? And he's like, what if we did this, this, and this? We could actually make that part of the gameplay. I was like, yes, that kind of stuff is to me what pre-production is, is the happy accidents, you know, the the weird times in, it's, you know, it's preschool, right? Blocks. You're just making stuff and, and you have no plan, right? Uh, because I think that it's in hindsight, it's super easy to look back and go, oh, well, we should have planned better. I don't know. It's, it's, tell me the best creative inspiration that was planned for, right? Like, I just never, it's never worked out in my career. Like, do you have people on the team who say, who, who ask that continually, who say, well, the solution is just better planning? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Do you, what is, what's the right way to answer that complaint? Uh, um, it, they are both right and wrong, right? And that's the frustrating answer that nobody likes to hear. But the reality is, yes, there are certain things that we have to plan better. But inspiration and and aha, mm -hmm. aha or not, it's not planned, right? The, yeah. the, some of the greatest and most interesting breakthroughs that we've ever had did not come from sitting in a room, divorced from the concept or the problem and make some sort of spreadsheet plan and then follow said spreadsheet plan and then reach the end. There are certain things that it, that's necessary for. You have to use that strategy. That's how you final a game, right? We never would have gotten through that last year without the, the production crew that we have, the analytical minds that we have, and the just tireless passion that we have in our team. But prior to that, it is lightning in a bottle, yeah. right? And, and you can't rush innovation in some ways, but in, 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 in really what it comes down to is you're trying to create pieces that then fit together and make something new and interesting, but then can be taken apart and made something even more new and interesting. And that's like, I just don't know anybody can plan. It's like trying to say you can plan a combat system. And I'm part of the problem as well that complains about it because I complained to our combat team for years, like, why isn't the combat base loop done? Because we're talking like, we pushed that to three and a half years. Three and a half years into the game, the combat base loop was not fully defined, and they kept telling me, a couple more months, a couple more months, right? And I'm just like, ah, oh, I'm going crazy. <laughs> but I mean, I understand, because it's thousands and thousands of individual little pieces that all fit together in the right way that give you that one core loop that says, there it is, right? And we have the high-level desire of what we want, but it requires you to fiddle, right? It is, it is Legos, right? But Legos without a plan uh, and, and sitting all over the floor... Except they're all the same color, and it's dark, and you have to pick them up with a little like extender uh, sort of device. So you can't feel what they look like. Everything is so removed, and you can only look at the end picture when you turn the light on for five seconds, right? It's that level <laughs> of create analogy. chaos, you know? <laughs> well, so. were, there, were, were there points, though, during the, call it the chaos of production, where you did see that light bulb come on, and you had an inflection point with either combat or story, or macro layout, where you knew that some massive part of the game was going to work. Yeah, the axe throwing. Okay. Yeah, like the uh, Vince Napoli and George Mall. George Mall was the programmer, and Vince Napoli was the systems designer. Um, they had talked about this thing with the axe and did a little experiment and showed me at Vince's desk, and I knew right away, I was like, okay, you know, had he pitched it verbally, he would have pitched it. It's like Thor, you know, and, and I would have been like, oh, right. So he's like, all right, I know that I don't want you to think of that. So I will show it to you and then I'll talk you through what I'm thinking we're going to do. And then I'm going to explain to you what George, the programmer, is going to plan to do. Right. And that second part was the key. Hmm. Right. So that it's like if it was just an animation of throwing it out and coming back, I was like, nah. Yeah, whatever. That's not really that interesting. The idea of attaching the recall to a button, the idea of having the programming be able to say the axe can stay out anywhere, stick in anything, have a bounce off deflection. Like we went through a lot of iterations as we we sort of evolved that, but that first idea was like, no, this is this is something, right? And it had no very crude sound effects, very crude everything. But I was like, okay, this this is it. Like we've we figured out the up close combat as far as like axe sticking and eventually it'll just get whittled down to what it needs to be but this is the bombastic this is the wow this is great right and i think much to their uh chagrin maybe uh because i fell in love with the axe throwing so much that every review was me just throwing the axe to various parts of the the, the level and everybody in the room going like stop doing it can you just like that was the new double jump because in previous games i would review levels and i would just double jump everywhere 
right? And uh, I think Eric Williams is the one that would just like yell at me in the middle of a meeting, stop jumping. You know, it's distracting. I'm like, I can't help it. It's 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 like Pavlovian, uh, and the axe was the same way. That it was one. I could point out that there was no collision in all these different places, <laughs> uh, but two, it's just so damn satisfying. Well, let me. But was it satisfying for you before that sound effect of it coming back to you went in, and before the little camera shake? Yeah, it wasn't okay. It was satisfying because of the the first instinct they had was to put it on a button. Hmm. So they had built that, and they said, "All right, you pr- you throw the axe out and you press the triangle button to re- recall it, right?" And I think it was actually square button at that time before we had established that a trace button would be square. And uh, you know, then as they started working through the problem, they're like, "Oh, well, people like it if you could just keep hitting the R one and the axe recalls automatically." And I was like, no, I hate that. Like, they put it in, and I felt like it was the axe would come back, and I didn't know why. And I couldn't have that agency to say, I want to leave it out there, and I want to take care of this enemy and just leave it. But it would call back on its own, and I'd be like, what did I do? Well, that's one of the, you know, combos is that it'll just automatically call back. I was like, no, no. And, like, I definitely, like, fought hard against them and saying, like, we need to get rid of it. And it was, like, a year and a half to two years to get rid of it completely. Well, is that because people were saying you're wrong i don't believe yes. you okay but the systems under who originally came up with the axe throwing thing was like this is how it needs to be and i'm like dude i get it but no your original idea was awesome right and it's not me just holding on to the past it's me saying you created something cool with this idea of the agency behind it the separate button to recall it meant that i as the player could determine when i want to do it that we can't lose that that's part of this new combat system that is the player control of it as opposed to the designer control of dial in this combo and the combo happens the way the designer wants it to happen. I'm like, we don't want that, right? We want the freedom. And he's just like, no, I just think this is going to be so much better. And he really resisted. I mean, it was it was years of trying to get those auto recalls back until we figured out, okay, there's a way you can buy the recall and attach it to know this is the predictable response, right? I want to do this. And that whole like triangle button to pull the axe off your back, that didn't come out until really late. Yeah. Like I, I didn't even occur to me, you know, that I was like, oh, I can put the axe back with the D pad. I like that. Like I can I can make the choice. I could throw it out or I could put it away and then go full on fisticuffs. And someone had actually come up with the idea of, oh, you press triangle button, we'll give them a little bit of an advantage. And somebody was measuring that like week one of the game coming out. They're really? Like, yeah. Oh. They're like they did side by side videos and show that it was like eight frames. Uh, benefit okay. to press triangle button. So it was somebody doing like Gimme God of War and realizing triangle button is smarter to unsheath your axe because you will get a slight advantage. But it's an advantage to the people who are like hardcore good at the game because they're not talking about a huge amount of frames. I, well, in some of those battles, I feel like I need every single advantage I can mm-hmm. get. So that's like, that's good to know. Yeah, the Valkyries especially. Uh, they mop the floor with me constantly. <laughs> uh, I, saw, I get a lot of tweets about that, of like especially Seeker and uh, that they're just like, you know, I hate you. You made me break <laughs> a controller. A right, yeah. And then you, I'm like, you got to watch the video of, uh, I think his name is Farzad, uh, Farad. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name. But he did like a, a, a Gimme God of War, no upgrade, no hit, uh, defeat of the final Valkyrie. Right? And I was just like, uh, okay. And the best was, he was kind of surprised halfway through that that's what was happening. Oh, look, I haven't gotten hit yet. Like that was, it was, I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, I just remember because, like, you literally get hit like once and 75, 80% of your life gone. Well, it, it is surprising sometimes how amazing people are at the games that yes. you make, right? One so makes. Oh, surprising. We had, a, we had a speedrunner come in and play through Spyro, the first Spyro of the Dragon, in 30 minutes, the entire game. What? And ex- that was uh, uh, Brian Hastings uh, and I were sitting here l- watching him and, and saying, what? about every 30 <laughs> seconds going how did you figure that out how did you That's figure that amazing. out amazing but it is but it's really cool and it, i how passionate our players yeah. are right collectively yes. about either finding exploits or becoming experts at the game yep. or an expert in certain areas of the game yeah. and how people discuss these items as communities because he was describing to us how there are certain people who are very, very good at one aspect of a game and will share that information with other speedrunners and they collectively come up with overall strategies to get yes. to the game. Yeah, so, somebody finds an exploit and it's like they're, it's great because you hear them talk about it, like they reference like this person found this exploit, you know, like, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Or, or strategies. I, yeah. I think for God of War in particular, I think strategy in combat is huge. And it's, I think you do a really good job of disguising it because it's over the top, bombastic yeah, and, yeah. and super fun. But at the same time, the, the mechanics underlying it are complex and 
when you know what you're doing, it gives you that, for me at least, it gives me that thrill, yeah. that feeling that I'm slowly making my way towards mastery. I don't think I'll ever get there. Right. But that layering, that layering of combat to me for this one was very different from previous games. And so did you as a team spend a lot of time sort of charting out that layering of combat and the depth of, of progression that sort of feeds into combat? Yes. Uh, although that makes it seem like it was so much more organized. Uh, <laughs> it, it was... It was a little bit uh, that we have really smart people who are just savant, sort of beautiful mind level combat uh, people that that I think understand this so much better than anybody else. That a lot of the times they're like, "Don't worry, just trust me, I got this." Right? There's okay. a lot of that. Like, "Yeah, hey, don't worry, don't worry. I've explained it to you. Don't, you don't get it. Don't worry, it'll be fine." <laughs> right? And. The, it is so complicated that even when you give the high level of like, hey, we're going to have this, this, and this, right? It just opens up to, well, then wait, what does this mean? How are we going to connect this? And it's like, you just have to trust me, right? That this is going to work out. Hmm. And the upgrading and and, and sort of, uh, I would say, the, the, the sort of meta, uh, meta game that we had, uh, that was a, a difficult thing to get out because some people in the studio were still used to sort of the old way of working, which was that, just trust me, let me go away leave me alone for like six months and then I'll just show you this finished product that's amazing, right? And I was like, uh, dude, we have like 300 people. Uh, we cannot just do that, right? You need to you need to document this and then we need to really exhaustively go through the documents to ensure, well, what does that mean? What does that connect mm -hmm. to, right? And then when we finally got everybody on board to do that, it was that realization of like, oh, wow, it's way more complicated than I thought, right? So that while they did understand it very intimately and very well, no human being can carry the level of complexity in their head Right, you have to chart it out. You have to map it out. Unfortunately, that just didn't happen until the later part of it. Um, uh, but when it did, like it started really illustrating the the issues, the the good things, uh, and the things that we needed to really kind of focus in and go like, all right, this is very good. I mean, the playtesting again is is so good because you're getting twenty people every two weeks, right, playing the game and then finding all the issues. And it's like as complex and as as robust as this was. Um, you needed to make sure everybody could touch everything. Doing, hey, does this work? Does that work? Um, and I mean, it is an exploration in the dark a lot of the times. That even yeah. though you know what you want, uh, it doesn't necessarily ever end up looking exactly like that, yeah. right? It always is like the oh, that's surprising. I wonder why they didn't like that, you know. And then it, it literally sometimes it's just verbiage, right? Like that. It's like oh, we just have to word it differently. And then all of a sudden, it makes complete sense. Or you know what? It's not for that type of player. So there's a lot of things in the game, um, you know that that it's like oh, well, some people say all oh, these these upgrades are useless. And it's like mm, yes, for you, you're not that type of player. There are some type of players who are going to want to have glass cannon, right? And they're going to want this, right? Or this is a really technical one that it seems useless to you, but there's a small subset of players who are going to really appreciate this. And I think that was a hard thing, I think, how across the you, board. Yeah, how did you justify that? We, we, we argue about this all the time, yeah. that if you're talking about what you believe is a, small, is a subset mm -hmm. of your players who will appreciate a particular feature, then why spend all of that time on the feature? Yeah, and it's the balance of the size of the feature versus the, yeah. you know, the, the 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 sort of player base that it will appeal to. But I usually justify it as the whole of saying that choice means something mm -hmm. when there are several obvious, I don't really want that choices, right? Because what we discovered through the development of this was that everybody's, I don't really want that choice is different, right? We'd never experienced this on the previous God of Wars that when you went and did a play test, you could rest assured that when you asked what was the epic moment for you uh, every 30 minutes or 45 minutes you asked that question, right? You'd get the same responses, right? 20 people, 18 out of 20 would always give you the same five epic moments, right? And you'd go, yes, score, we did it, right? Uh, but that's not video games, right? Video games is I ask 20 people what was an epic moment for you and I get 20 different responses. That's video games. That's the agency of the individual and the player to be able to immerse themselves in the world and create something, uh, or so many different experiences, so many diverse experiences that we are able to connect with people. You know, God of War previously, and this is not a negative. I don't want people to think I'm 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 saying things negative about previous God of Wars, but like 
it was appealing to the one type, right? It's the raw vengeance, right? Like it was very much like you, if you like badass and like 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 heads exploding, that's it, right? But on this one, there are a lot. Uh, there's the diversity of sort of emotional range, right? That sense of like people are connecting it because they felt happy about something, which is just so interesting in a God of War game to say like, I like Brock. He's funny and he makes me happy, right? Or I really like the Witch of the Woods. Right, because she's a very interesting character. She's nice, mm-hmm. you know. I love the 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 sort of way that she interacts with these characters. We just haven't had that in the previous games, and it always bummed me out that we never really reached. I think further, and then you look at mechanically the same thing that you start to say, "Well, we don't need this." Well, that's not necessarily true. It's like the battle I have with level design all the time. You have to be comfortable with your your content not being seen. Right, and that really rubs people the wrong way, and I, I never know how to present that idea to people simply because it's it's like what they're hearing is your content is important, and what I'm trying to say is, is an experience is fantastic when you go to school the next day and somebody goes, did you know you could do this, and you run home and you go do it, right? That's awesome, but if everybody has the exact same experience all the way through, it doesn't feel like it's personal or tailored to you, right? And I think to me. I got that in a slightly linear experience from Shadow of the Colossus, where the first Colossus I found, I truly felt like I was the first person to ever find it. I knew that I wasn't, right? I knew that I wasn't the only person to find it, but it felt like that sense of discovery. I was rewarded for being curious, and that phrase, reward for being curious, was something I kept hammering to people throughout, and I said, that should be in our systems. That should be in our crafting. You know, That should be in the walking and navigating around the world. It should be in talking to people. I'm curious if I hit the triangle button to talk to, to Brock. Like, I've watched these playthroughs uh, after the game was out and see people wander around and then come back and go, whoa, there's a triangle button now at the, the shop. And then they hit it, and they're like, oh, my God, that's great. And they're listening, and this is fantastic, right? Or the people go around on the boat and then just make circles in front of the dock. And we're like, what's going on? Are they? Is it broke? Do they not know where to go? What's happening? And then we go interview them, and they're like, oh, no, no, this story was going on. I just wanted to hear the rest. So I didn't want to get out of there until he finished the story. He didn't know if it would pick up after it left I've off. had that exact same experience. Yeah. And I actually, I what was what I loved, loved, loved was I docked on, on in one place and cut off the story uh, because uh, Kratos was telling Atreus about something. I can't yeah. remember exactly what it was. And then I, I thought to myself, oh, man, I, I blew it. I got back into the boat, and, it, and Kratos says, okay, well, let me continue the story in, yeah. his, in his own Kratos way. That was a fantastic moment yeah. for me as a gamer. And it That's was awesome. as, yeah, you guys were thinking uh, thinking this through and thinking about what what players, I think, want. It was what we wanted, right? Like yeah. we play Uncharted 4, and they did that. Yeah. They left the, the Jeep. And right. everyone's arguing, and they come back, where were we, right? Like, And they go right back to it. And so we were like, hey, we're going to go over and talk to them. And what did they do, right? How did you get your resumes to work? What was the tricks you needed to do? And again, every trick or the answer to every trick is like asking the magician, how did they do it? And then when they tell you, you're just like, <laughs> how underwhelming is that? It's just a lot of work. Right? Like, there's no magic trick of like, ba ba, right? And you just expect like a little hand wave, and all of a sudden everything's gonna be great. But the reality is, no, it's just a lot of work, like to really break things up and plan in advance. So, yeah, I mean, it's, but it in a way, that's amazing. That's, that's design and development growing up and maturing, yeah. right? I mean, that's us, I think, as an, in, I imagine, as an industry becoming, as you said earlier in our talk, wiser. Yeah, you know, it's, it's sort of a wisdom that comes with having made many games and having lots of things that we wish we could have done. Yep. And certainly as players, things that we wish we could experience. Yep. Yeah, it is that like it becomes that continued bucket list of like, I wish we could have this, right? The no yeah. camera was a, an idea I carried around to a lot of different studios, right? That in some very uh, way, shape or form, I was bringing it up and talking about it at Avalanche when I was working with them on that Mad Max thing. And talking to George about it when I was working with him. Uh, and then Crystal Dynamics, right? When I was working on Tomb Raider and then moving into potentially directing the second one. You know, and just realizing like, all right, this this is something I want to do. And at the initial pitch was crazier, right? It was that idea of I want to not only eliminate the sort of, you know, verbs of, of camera language, but I, I want to eliminate cinematics, right? That I want to eliminate the concept of stopping and being told a story and saying it's the theater in the round, right? Like you go into a, a house and there is a play going on 
And if you go there five nights in a row, wherever you go and wander around the house, you experience the, the experience in a different way. And you will miss stuff, right? And that's the hardest sell to anyone, right? Is to say, they will miss your work. But that's not the point, right? The point is, is that potentially they'll come back they'll experience it in a different way. And it's like, there is all these like safeguards you have to put in to figure out, well, how do they experience it if they've missed this, right? So it is from the beginning, you have to write in a certain way, right? And we realized very quickly that that challenge was hard to take on both. Mm -hmm. Hard to take on the idea of eliminating camera cuts completely as well as then eliminating the concept of the cinematic break and more like, I'm going to experience this, right? It came from when I was in, in Chicago, uh, there was this play called Tony and Tina's Wedding, right? And it was an experiential play where basically it was a, a wedding uh, reception. That was the play. That you'd go to a wedding okay. reception, you'd sit down at a table, you'd be seated at a table with a bunch of other people. Some of them would be part of the wedding party. Some of them would just be random people who just went to this experience. And then your play would be experiencing a wedding reception so there'd be drama going on with the the bride and groom there would be you know the the dancing somebody would get drunk speeches would happen drama would happen at your table right sometimes you'd sit at the right table that actually had somebody who was involved in a big drama with the bride and groom so then all of a sudden in front of you all this stuff is happening but if you come back a different night it's going to happen completely differently right so it felt more like a wedding reception less like a play Right. And I think for me, I was looking at that going like, that's amazing. Right. Because there are conversations happening on the other side of the room that I'm going to miss. And that's OK, because the overall experience was exactly what they were aiming for. It just became this sort of changing thing. And at the time, you know, I was in college, so I, I did not understand what it was I was seeing and how it was going to connect to, to me later in life. Um, but then once I started looking at this idea of like, what do we do in games? Right. We go, we love movies and we love TV. So we pretty much try to make movies and TV in our games, right? And I was just, for me, uh, starting to work with a bunch of filmmakers, I realized like filmmakers are looking over at games and going, ah, Frontier, I see something over here. I want to get involved in that. And there was a little bit of the ego on my side of saying, I don't want these filmmakers coming in and making all the breakthroughs, right? We're, we've been working on this for a while. I want us to be the ones to do, to do the interesting things, right? And Maybe in the AAA space, because I think indie does a lot of the interesting things. They're taking all the risks and, and being able to do these really cool, crazy, off-the-wall things. And traditionally, people look at AAA and say, like, you guys are risk-averse, right? You don't take risks. Uh, so it became like a, I have to find the people that I can socially engineer enough to take these crazy risks on something that's very big. And it turned out, it was just having worked with Sony for a long time, right? I just seemed, everything came at the right time yeah. right like the my going back at that time what i've been through the idea the people who are working there and just the climate of the gaming public everything just coalesced well i think i think the gaming climate of the gaming public is a great point i mean gamers are becoming almost exponentially more sophisticated yes. when it comes to their expectations and and we're feeding that those expectations every with every game we all release yeah and so how do you deal with that when you're thinking about these sort of groundbreaking features and thinking ahead to what comes next how do you how do you not become almost depressed when mm -hmm. you think about this insatiable demand for innovation yeah it's uh, you do become depressed. That's, you, just sort of, <laughs> you embrace it. and uh, Well, that, there you, you know, go, embracing it. Yeah, you embrace way. it and you realize that it's never good enough. Right. right. Like, like a, a good example, and I mean, it's not that good example, but this is an example of like New Game Plus was part of the plan mm -hmm. from the beginning. And so was Photobook. But both of those things had to be cut because of stability of the game, right? So that it was like, oh, we all wanted this, right? They, we all wanted both of these things because we love that part of games, right? But... Everything kind of just came down to the overall scoping of things and realized like, ah, oh, we got to push it. We got to push it back further. And it just kept being the can that we kicked further down the road. And I think as you start to look at things like innovation and, and sort of like, oh, well, this game has this feature. Why don't you have this feature? I think it, for me, it's always just got to be a gut thing. Right? Yeah. That I just have to, I've learned over the years that I just have to trust my gut and say something that gets me excited 
something when like the first time I saw the axe story and I was like, yes. And I just couldn't stop going around to different people's desks and bragging about it and saying, this was so awesome. You have to go check this out. The snow tech that, that we had where you kick around the snow and somebody could fall in the snow and move it aside. I, I sort of crashed one of the visual effects artist desks uh, and just said, what, what is that? Show me that. And they're like, oh, it's not ready for you to see. I'm like, uh, yeah, too bad. I'm here. Show me it. And they're talking about it. And then Florian Strauss is the, the graphics programmer, technical director. And uh, he's the one that kind of had come up with this idea. And he was like, it's not ready. And don't get go crazy and use it everywhere. I'm just like, <laughs> all these things are the things I'm going to do now because you're telling me not to do it. You need to learn about me. Dude. I'm going to do that. Uh, but it's like those kinds of things that I was like, I could feel it. Yeah, you just you have this emotional and visceral response to something, and I got I just learned to just trust that and know that if I'm cold or lukewarm on something, it's because it's not speaking to me, and that I have to trust that. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, like I think if I looked too much externally for that, I would not have gotten rid of the jump, right? Uh, and the jump was a smart decision. Some people say, "Oh, a game without a jump—that's stupid," but it was a smart decision of. We have a lot of battles to fight. Yeah. We have wars coming from all fronts. Don't add another one, right? The same thing of like swimming, right? As much as I wanted swimming, I understood when they explained to me, it's going to be hard to get Atreus to navigate on a 2D plane. Now you want him to navigate in a 3D space. Like that's step three. We got to get step one. And I was like, all right, I get it, right? But the bonus is... I can have them in a boat and they talk a lot more and that's better. They can't talk underwater. So we actually get more of a story time thing. But then the boat became the most hated feature for years, right? There's a few people that believed in it that wanted to make it work. Um, but mostly the phrase was, well, we could cut the boat, right? Like, and that was literally what people would say <laughs> in all the situations. It's like, ooh, this is going to be, this is going to be hard. I don't know. Do we have enough time to finish this? Well, we could cut the boat. Like, <laughs> Everybody wanted to get rid of it. They just hated the boat. And I was like, guys, trust me. I know it's ugly right now, but it will benefit. And its benefit is this is the time you get to hear from these two characters. And it wasn't until those stories came in from Mimir and Kratos that I think a lot of people on the team then went, oh. Because they, you know, I don't even think the writers at the time could see that what stories we were going to tell and whether they were going to work. And it's just, again, an aha moment of somebody saying, what if we told uh, those sort of like classic Aesop's fables, right? That these things are timeless and that they date back to his time. Like it would be interesting if he was telling these stories and he's terrible at storytelling. And it's like we add a little bit of the humor into that. Uh, so I don't know. I just, it is definitely, you got to just trust your gut. Well, I, I, I was laughing because when you use that example of, hey, we're out of scope, let's just cut the boat. Yeah. It is such a, a great uh, window into development when when somebody doesn't like something yep. there's a go-to place right which is let's just i'm going to figure out a really clever way to get rid of this that's yep. going to help the game and it's my uh, my my number one hatred right it, yeah but uh, but it also i i love that example and i hope people are, are especially developers listening to the the program take this to heart that there usually is a way to make a to, to combine features to make them really unique and that yeah. story story plus boat Right, but we've been doing. We developers have been making, call it simple tra traversal mechanisms forever, yeah. and it's always sort of the bane of our existence. You have to get from point A to point B, and you got to figure out how to make it interesting. Yep. And and sometimes, a lot of the times, we just fail. Mm -hmm. We just kind of accept it, and players accept it as well. So yeah, it's 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 the faith that it's the the different experiences, right? Because I think if you take it in a vacuum, you look at it, and you go, all you're doing is listening to people talk. That's boring. Right. I hate that. Right. So at one point, we had a ranked sort of, this is what the boat is all about. First, it was a, a, like a, a slightly more emotional, like, like you know, human level to connect to why the boat was going to exist with pictures and all that stuff. And then it kind of went down to here mechanically what we're doing. This is a navigation tool to allow you to have diversity in navigation. Then it is a, a story tool to get you to know the characters, right? Then it is an exploration tool to pick up different things within the world. Then there is combat. And the combat was there because in every God of War game, we always added combat to everything. Climbing combat, jumping combat, you know, like combat was everywhere. And, and that was part of the game. And that one got lost because of scope. Like we removed, finally it was like, all right, we got to take the combat off the list. And that was actually one of those scope saved us. Mm. I think if we tried to shove combat in there, right, underdeveloped and undercooked, it would have ruined the experience. Yeah. And there was this purity there that 
I think all of us were sort of afraid of, which was oh, it's just yeah, just going around, right? Just talking, right? And it's like, yeah, but maybe that's good enough. And if the talking is good, and it took the playtesters showing us that they won't dock until the story's finished, yeah. that we went, oh, great, people are into this, right? If the story is interesting, and again, I think it's the diversity of the story, meaning it's not just serious, right? It's not just like dark, and here it is, all is dark, dark, dark. It's like, no, we are able to laugh, right? We are able to have fun with this, and it's not about playing for a joke. It's about sometimes life is silly, yeah. right? Even in the fantastic and the weird, that's the best part about Norse mythology. And, and Scandinavians in general, they have the most bizarre sense of humor ever, right? Uh, but it's it adds this sense of the real, right? That's my favorite part about that. Well, it does. It, it grounds a relationship between the two characters for me. Right. And, and it makes it, it adds a sort of a dimension I wasn't expecting. Yeah. But it's also a mental mode switch for me. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the boat because I got to take a break yeah. from, from everything else. That's and the excellent, like, sort of side effect that it was the unplanned need of when you don't have a cut camera, the urgency of everything, the yeah. immediacy was something I'm like, oh, I know that's going to feel great. But the fatigue was something we just sort of had to solve accidentally. And the boat was like the accidental fatigue solve. It was like, oh, okay, you could calm down. It was that kind of, you know, moving around slower. Um, nobody was going to jump you. You had a bit more of like this, I can look around. And the no-cut basically allowed you to relax yeah. a little bit, right? And I just, I couldn't have planned that we needed that, right? Because nobody really had done something like this. So we didn't know what are the what are the negatives, right? Uh so this, that just kind of comes, goes back to being open-minded about design, right? That's yeah. the challenge. I think that it's sort of a dichotomy we all have, we, we, we deal with where we've got schedules, milestones, but at the same time, while we're in production, we're still coming up with stuff yep. and we're still trying things out. And you can't out. stop coming up with yeah. stuff. You have to keep coming up with stuff because it's not like you're going to come up with your only good ideas in the beginning, right? Right. It's like it evolves throughout the entirety. And it's like, I learned, I think being open to those things from working with uh, the film directors and mm. kind of understanding, uh, you know, like George and a, a couple of the writers that he had. And just let um, me let me stop you there for people who don't know George Miller. George is Miller, who you're yeah, referencing. yeah, Mr. Fury Road guy, the coolest human on the planet. Um, he is a really cool guy. He came by Insomniac. Did he? Yeah, a few years ago. I probably eight years ago. This is or more. It was after he had finished Happy Feet. And oh my god! I think I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he just just the nicest, down to earth yeah. guy, most down to earth guy. Yeah, we were, like I actually visited Maxis Will Wright with him, and like meeting Will Wright five minutes, he started talking about his biggest failure. Hmm. Like it's like that level of humility and that level of sort of openness and just kind of always learning. Right, the guy's yeah. in his seventies and he's still like, well, "Well, how did you do that?" Right? right. Like he asks and he inquires and he listens and he learns. And that part, as well as this idea that he was talking to me about, like the writers are talking about, is like, you know, you're looking for this moment of truth, right? And even if you only get one, you've got that success and you can build from that. And part of it is feeling like you are an exposed nerve. You're open to these emotions, right? And it's like working with the actors on this, this game was about this idea of being open, right? And being able to feel what is going on and and really being open to letting them go right like i think that was the thing i really would never have been able to succeed at this had i not worked with him because we're talking about four and a half to seven minute single take scenes if i was super rigid and said everything has to be to the letter of the script it would have gone horribly bad hmm. right because these actors that we chose one are brilliant uh two are able to really kind of work well together and find pieces that we didn't even know needed to be there. And and I felt like those performances were so elevated by the fact that the conversations we had were about driving towards a space versus hit this line, then do this, right? You know, and it's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I loved uh, working with the actors that we worked with now. And I think part of it does really relate to the fact that I learned so much of one piece and realize that that one piece, that idea of being open can apply to everything. Literally every single thing that we're doing is that you're not always needing to be the right person, right? Or you're not you need to always need to be right, right? You 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 need to be aware and you need to just keep redirecting to the right place, right? Because sure, I say that's the course, go north, right? 
But the reality is if the north is the wrong way to go, I don't care if I'm right and I fall, you know, fall off the edge of some sort of like waterfall or something because I wasn't directing myself to the right place. It is about, I need to get to the right location. Yeah. So I don't care who's right. I care that I'm the one going, nope, we're wrong. Let's go over to the left now. Let's do this, right? And invariably you're going to have, oh, he doesn't know what he wants. Oh, he's, look at this. He's just trying to figure it out. And it's like, yes. And unfortunately your inexperience is causing you to say that. Like, because if you were experienced, you'd realize, oh, okay, cool. All of it is is a is a redirect, is a recharting of courses, right? You never set a single course and then just roll with it. There's always something in the way. There's always a new sort of turn you're going to have to make. And if you're smart, you can be open to it and then sort of take the, the hits from people who are just like, oh, he doesn't know what he wants, right? Uh, Do you get that to your face? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And I think that's kind of cool, actually. It is. That our team is very open. They will tell you you sucked your face, yeah. which I think really sort of broke the writers in the beginning because, you know, they were doing the voiceovers. So the, the one we were, were trying to scratch find. Voice? Scratch? Yeah, scratch okay. voices. Uh, so Rich Gobert and Matt Sophos both were recording Kratos and, and, and Atreus uh, of their first drafts and then playing it for the team. So the team would play through it and... You know, team's pretty brutal. Like they'll just, oh, this sucks. This is the worst, right? One guy said that it was the it's like playing a child abuse simulator, right? And it's like the writers are already, you know, like sensitive. Like I'm right there with them when I write something and then I put it out there. Like it's it's hard. You gotta take a lot of abuse, right? But that's the process. Yeah. The process is I'd rather everybody in that studio tear my work apart, tear their work apart, instead of people outside. Well, what kind of coaching do you give somebody who may not be used to that? And is experiencing it for the first time. And I, I, mm. I bring this up because we have company-wide play tests as well, and we ask for feedback. And it can often be pretty blunt. And the people who are giving the feedback, A, don't know what effect their <laughs> feedback has. And the people who are receiving the feedback may not have gotten as pointed critique, uh, a critique as they are getting now. Yeah. So is there any, what advice would you have for somebody who's in a leadership position who is coaching their team through that process? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I feel like it's the same thing I fall back on in, and it's not in a condescending way, but in like fatherhood is like, talk to him, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like anything going on with my son at all is more about like, go talk to him about it, right? And just, hey, like this, yeah, that sucked, right? You know, that wasn't, that wasn't very fun. But no, this is why it's going to be better, right? That, that you need people to say things aren't bad. They're not saying you're bad. They're not saying even the overall concept of where you're trying to go is bad. They're saying this isn't working. And yeah. maybe sometimes they are saying this is a dead end. And sometimes it is a dead end, right? And that's okay, right? That's fine. You know, Eric Stoltz played Indiana Jones at one point, right? No, no, no. I, Eric Stoltz played Marty McFly okay. at one point. So they screen tested him. It was Tom Selleck who played Indiana Jones, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. they actually shot a bunch of stuff with Eric Stoltz and then ended up reshooting Uh with uh, Michael J. Fox. And it's like, again, it wasn't that Eric Stoltz was bad. It was that he wasn't right for that. And sometimes your idea is not right, right? And I think we have to throw a thousand things against the wall to have one thing stick. I, I think, though, that what you, one of the things you just said was, it's okay. Yeah. And it's difficult often, I think, when you're in the throes of production to understand that failure is okay. And it's yes. important to do that, to fail frequently, because if you don't, you're not going to get the best idea. Yep. You're going to settle, right? And and I guess along those lines, in terms of leadership, how do you prevent settling? And mm. when I say settling, looking at an idea and you see it, you see it's going to be okay, and you know you have a limited amount of time left, but you don't, you feel in your gut that it's just not going to be good enough. Yeah, that's hard because it is like a thousands of calculations going on at that moment, right? That you're looking at it and you're going, okay. This isn't good enough. I know it needs to get better. How important is it? And then I start evaluating okay. it against everything else and determining, can we get by, right? And sometimes I will reverse that decision too. I will say, oh, fine. In the room, I will say, we have to just let it, we have to let it go. This isn't going to work. And then an hour later, I'll realize I was wrong, right? Or a day later. Sometimes I'll wake up the next morning and realize I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. And then in a panic, I go to Yumi Yang, who is my sort of production partner on all of this, and vent 
and act like a crazy person. And then she sits there very calmly nodding her head, right? And lets me go through everything, tire myself out, and then says, all right, well, let's look into this, right? Let's look into it. Let's talk about it. And But we're going to have to get rid of something else. You know, there's always a balance. You have to look at something else and say, what else is going to give here? Usually I would nod my head and say, sure, I'll cut something later. And I never cut something later. Uh, or maybe I do and I, they, they socially engineered me. Um, <laughs> but the settling, sometimes you have to settle. I mean, that's the yeah. the other thing is is you do have to say, well, this is good enough, right? Yeah. And it goes back to me, the gut of like, this is good enough. Is it okay? Right? I mean, there was... There was how important point. is it, right? I, mean, yeah. I think that's what you... That, that's what, what a great way to to make that call right is prior to prioritizing it yeah is it gonna make I, I don't know if i'm i mean i i guess that's is what happening like I, I don't know if i'm getting as organized as like make that list or anything but it is like that how much of a stir in my stomach does it does it have right and there's tons tons of things that didn't get in i was convinced uh and, and still to this day i'm convinced that i wanted a norse uh language subtitle and audio re-recording of the entire game so that whole like wow. you know uh i wanted to pay an homage and a respect to the, the the sort of culture that 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 all of this was born from right but the cost obviously is big because you got to get people who can speak all this right so the I- icelandic actors are probably the only people who can understand most of ancient norse and be able to to, to speak it conversantly uh but still, I was like, oh, we got to do this. And it just kept falling off the radar or like not being something that was important. I'm like, guys, I actually think this will be really bad if we're not at least paying any kind of respect. Because most of the time you don't do translations um, for Swedish or Norwegian because a lot of people in Scandinavia like to speak English. Like the younger generations all learn English and they like to play the games sometimes in English. And I was like, I was really thinking this is important. So I, I sort of lost that battle and let it go even though it bugged me. And still to this day bugs me, and I still go to people and say, "We should do this. We should do this. Come on, <laughs> right?" Because I think I personally think it's cool. Like I don't know how many people appreciate it. It is one of those fraction of a fraction, maybe that'll be like I just played through again in ancient Norse, and you know, it's a dead language. No one's no one's gonna understand it. Scholars are gonna understand it and probably criticize whatever we did wrong or mispronounced, right? Um, but I don't know. It's just like a, it's like that weird thing that I think doesn't matter, but maybe it does, right? Well, maybe it's an opportunity for people to. To send you a tweet. And, there you go. And right? say, and then you start can, a campaign. Then, then it's a post launch, yeah. post launch content. I, I have to say that uh, when I was asking Insomniacs if they had questions for you, one of the questions was, "Can we please have customizable beards for for DLC?" Customizable beards, fantastic! Oh my god, that would be good. Uh, the amount of work that went into that beard um, is astounding, right? Because the trick is like old school PS2 trick. Okay. It's not like beard growth technology or anything like it's that. Cards. It's, it's cards. It's alpha cards. Yeah. It's just millions of freaking cards. Yeah. Hand placed by Raph. Like that. That beard is years in the making of him just keep going back and obsessing sure. and getting it perfect. And I'm just when he showed me the trick, right? Because initially when I had uh, we started working on this, they were looking at like you know shaving a haircut. I think is what it's yeah. called. Like some program that does it. And I was like, eh, okay, cool. Like I guess it looks good, but it looks kind of weird, right? And I, it was just. It was the technology that was driving it versus the artistry. And then I think eventually he just got so tired of it that he just said, nope, this is how I'm going to do it. And literally all of the hair is done with the old school trick, but it's the same trick, which is hard work. Yeah. It is exhaustive, precise, single object at a time placement to form an entire head of hair. And it's like, you think about it, that's exactly how they do practical take that little pin thing and they poke one hair at a time in to create a full mask or a full outfit right for say king kong or something like that uh and it's like oh yeah that's literally everything is just the worst way you would want to <laughs> do it right so that's like, you always hope that there's some cool shortcut but there never is it's just like nope spend months right because when we scanned atreus's face this was the eye opener for me of like this generation and then what the future generations hold is that when we cast Sunny, I said, okay, I finally get it. That's what Atreus looks like, right? Like, I'm like, I don't just want to cast him. I want his face as Atreus. He is Atreus. Uh, and they're like, all right, well, we can do the face scanning and the fax poses and all that stuff. Um, two and a half years later, it was done. Two and a half years to do, beginning with the scans in San Diego to the point where all the fax poses work and they're hooked up and connected. Man, that is 
unreal, right? And it was just a year of, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Is it done yet? I annoyed so many people. Uh, well, I don't think it's, I imagine you weren't annoying people. I think that all of us on this generation have gotten taken by surprise. Anybody who's actually yeah. not doing character rigging or is not in the scanning business by how complex it really is and oh, and how difficult it is to find, to just you know, jump over that uncanny valley yeah. with a character in game. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's that combination of the lighting, the texturing, right. the face poses, and then the, that sort of unsung heroes, I think, of any sort of entertainment industry, the riggers, right? Yeah. That is ridiculous i i did take it for granted and i did was sort of treat it with a blase sort of attitude initially like whatever it's just the rig right uh no 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 it's the rigs right. are infinitely complex and being manipulated and fixed and tweaked and the the technical character group that we had you know axel grossman leading that group former was, insomniac by the way is he really yeah. oh man that guy is just a freaking genius yeah he is the john nash of rigging he's just so good <laughs> and yeah, and, and, and literally, it is being fixed weeks before release, yeah. right? We're still doing things that are fixing it, and you're realizing that, wow, it is it is forefront technology kind of stuff. We're talking about bleeding edge, that it's like we're still just figuring, oh, look at this, we just figured this out, this is wrong, and we got to fix this. Yeah, right? it really is, and I think people forget that all of this has to be done real time, too, when you're yes. actually, when you have all those poses, and they have to work together, and you've got the rig driving it, and... Plus, and I, it, one thing breaks, not just with rigging, but with lighting, with the shaders, yeah. then it all falls apart. Cascading failures. Yeah, and so you have to have the team really, really in sync to make yeah. those those faces, just the faces work, and then you've got the rest of the body. Yeah. That's but, why I'm always so fascinated that Naughty Dog has like almost no production, because th that's truly the way we're able to keep so many disparate groups communicating, is we have these producers who, you know... They do a job that sometimes feels like it's it's unappreciated, but it is so invaluable, Yeah, right? To be able to be the person who's carrying around a lot of this communication and a lot of this sort of details that these are inherent groups of people that don't like to talk to each other, that don't <laughs> like to talk. They want to sit behind, put their headphones on and work, and that's okay. I don't ever want to take that away from them. But then you still got to figure out, this person is working on this. Make sure that the other person is not working on that or not going in a different direction that's going to kind of crisscross them. Even with an army of producers who are literally doing nothing but bonding and, and connecting different people throughout the day, you still make those same mistakes. Yeah. Like, even with that. So, and they don't, they have like, what, one or two producers over at Naughty Dog? I was like, man, you guys are amazing because I couldn't do it without producers. I, it would be crazy. Well, I, I also think, though, that all of this comes as part of the maturing of our industry where we, we really can't sit behind our computers with headphones on all day long anymore. No. And it's and I, I see it here at Insomniac where people get up, walk over, and talk to each other because you have to. You really do have to share the information. And the fact that you and I can talk about what goes into a facial rig actually indicates that there is a lot of information sharing. Yeah. Right? It's not we're not in a business where we say, I just want a great face. Yeah. I don't care how it's done. Yep. It's just got to look good. We have to, designers, creative directors, producers have to understand the tech, which means talking to the teams and having the teams be able to uh, cogently, in layman's terms, yeah. explain it to all of us, which is awesome, right? Yep. I mean, that's really, that's one of the, for me, one of the most fun aspects of this industry. Yeah, yeah it is. Like, uh, it's, you're right. Like, I, I think the times of being sort of the J. Jonah Jameson, you know, just get me this, right? It's just not there anymore. You have to be able to to intelligently have a conversation. I think, you know what's great is also, I think Sony is fostering this idea that we're able to all talk to each other as well. Yeah. I think there's an invaluable nature to the fact that all of these studios, not only are we within distance of each other, but we're close enough to say like, hey, we want to, can we come over and talk to you about this, right? And it began way, way, way back on two to three, transitioning from God of War two to three, when some people from Naughty Dog came over and you know they were using the trip, I think, uh, the programmers to try to show the designers what they were asking for and how much pain it would be for them uh, to do it. And it totally <laughs> didn't work. Uh, the designers were like, no, we totally want this, right? Um, and we were looking at it going, they're doing some amazing stuff with their rigs, right? And we couldn't have gotten that information in any other way, right? And being able to actually say, how did you do this? What did you do there? Like I brought a copy of the game over uh, to show Neil when we were done. 
and then he's like, can I invite some people into the, the, the conference room, right? Or the, the, the screening room and we can uh, play it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. And it's just like classic, like it doesn't matter where you're at. Uh, when a bunch of developers do this, how do you do that? Are you doing this with the mip mapping? What are you doing with the, the, the hair? Like it was just like firing question after question. I was like, all right, there's a certain point that I'm not going to be able to answer any of these things good. But, you know, if we want, we can get people together and you guys can ask uh, those same questions because they got really technical really fast, right. right? And I'm like, that's awesome because I kind of do the same thing. How are you doing that, right? Like you immediately just want to understand what are they doing? What trick are they doing? And I think as a industry, we are better because of that. Uh, yep. And I think it, it is internally, we're learning those skills to allow us to then externally start connecting more with each other to ensure that look, we're all better. We're, gamers benefit by us being open with each other. Well, I think it also, players may not realize this or people outside the ind industry may not realize that despite the fact that we are competitors, right, we, we don't really compete. No. I mean, what we do, we, we share technology freely with each other because we realize it's the process yep. and the ideas, not necessarily, and, and the way we execute yep. those ideas in our own way, not necessarily the technological secrets yeah. that make these games what they are. Yeah. We want to make each other better. Yeah. Right? Because honestly, this is the one part that I don't understand. Like, I don't understand console wars. I don't understand any of that stuff because I am somebody who enjoys games, TVs, and movies first. Mm-hmm. So I want to see lots of great ones. And and if that means sharing something, awesome, awesome. I want you guys to succeed. I am so freaking excited for Spider-Man, right? And, and, and that's the thing. It's like people are like, I don't understand why you keep talking about these other things. It's like because I love games, yeah. right? Like I don't care in what console it comes out on. I play the hell out of my Switch, right? Like I love great games. And if great games come from us being open and supporting each other as developers, awesome. That's what we should do. That's absolutely what we should do. End of the day, sure, it's a business and everybody has their own business goals. Love it. But as creative people, as people who are the journeymen in the process of finding something amazing, man, we all benefit from being, you know, brothers and sisters in arms, you know? Totally agree. What a, what a, and that's a great place to end. Ah, on fantastic. That thing, seriously. So I, if people would like have more questions for you or, yeah. or would like to reach you, how, how do they do that? The at Corey Barlog, all one word on Twitter is probably the best way. I'm the worst at responding to emails. So I think people have sent a lot of emails. And uh, it's not that I'm ignoring you. I'm just overwhelmed with all of it. Uh, Twitter's the easier one because then I can get lost in a Twitter hole until 3 in the morning until Chris Avalon tells me to go to sleep. <laughs> And then awesome. I ignore him, and I don't go to sleep for an hour. <laughs> I love it. Well, Corey, thank you so much for being on. All right, Appreciate thank it. you, man. It was great to be here. Great to talk to you. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.